sweet once you get like positioned with the understanding that like monstrous things could exist your brain will naturally go there and uh i think it just really plays upon that and i'm gonna get into exactly like why it was so scary for kids and like why that was so effective um so you know let me do it uh, the film covers heavy themes in an abstract way, focusing on the young mind and how they perceive the world around them. Children themselves and their development perceive the world much differently than adults, and the world of a young mind is overwhelming and vast and hard to understand. As what is perceived visually, auditorily, and others through other sensory inputs is entirely dependent on your brain's best guess to fill in the blank and rationalize our surroundings. That's how the brain processes information. What you're looking at isn't even what you're looking at. <laughs> you know, it's just <laughs> your brain trying to rationalize what it's seeing. And the more context you have, the more accurate it's going to be. That's why they really highlight cognitive processing and development uh, in as you grow, uh, but children don't have all, all the information. Adult brains, brains have been around longer, so they have more context to pull for them, where children view the world without that context. So the fear and anxiety that children experience may seem silly to an adult viewing them, but is something very real for the child. Um, and what we see in the film is seemingly a child's first time entirely alone in the house, uh, although they are with a sibling. Uh, under the dark of night. And as we've covered in our early nightmares episode, the brain has a tendency to manipulate darkness and silence to fit the things we understand and know. So in presenting us with endless clips of that dark hallway and with like very little audio cues, like without the subtitles and without like a clear image of what's happening, your brain is tasked with filling in that blank space interpreting all those background sounds, interpreting that grainy image that's in front of you. And what was really creative in him taking that approach to filming is that he made his job a lot easier by doing that uh, because of the way that the brain works in that it will fill in those blanks. Um, and in manipulating that darkness and silence, the film uses this and runs with it by placing all of that like right in the purview and giving you really little other context. So it's kind of like when you're sitting in your bed at night and your brain has nothing else to grasp for, you know, you have like silence when you're like trying to go to bed mm -hmm. and all the rest of the world is slowed down and then your brain creates space within that. So like that's when your anxiety kicks in. That's when you're like, oh, let me remember every horrible thing that's ever happened to me as I lay here in bed. Or I other know, things, you know. The guy with the hat who torments me in my sleep paralysis. Yeah, exactly. Like your brain will fill in that space because of the lack of outside input that's taking place. So this film, just in knowing we're watching a horror movie, sets itself up to be scary the entire time, to make you tense the entire time. Mm -hmm. Um, so similarly, children's minds, absent of the context of lived experience, apply this method of perception to basically everything and base it mostly on emotional cues as well as the cues of the parental figures in their lives. Um, the greater gap in understanding and contextual data, the scarier an experience can become for a child. When taking situations that are overwhelming sensory-wise, children will fill these spaces with things they do not have the understanding for yet or around, and therefore will start to see things that would otherwise feel mundane to adults, but will perceive it as horrifying. Mm -hmm. So especially with the absence of a parental or peer sounding board, being alone for a small child can be very scary when all the, their needs are not able to be self-managed. So we see like these two kids basically having to deal with the absence of their parent without being of an age where they have the capabilities to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Like they don't have methods to feed themselves. They don't cook, you know, they're like little, little kids. Uh, they really rely on their parents ultimately. And the absence of them is terrifying for a multitude of reasons, but it's very evident for a child that the absence of their parent could lead to their harm. Um, could lead to their damage or even the loss of life. 
So this is why uh, neglect is so mentally and physically damaging for small children as the absence of a protective figure always has that possibility of resulting in loss of life. And the film itself plays upon this further by taking a house and morphing it into a horrific and endlessly expanding maze mostly absent of this parent figure. Um, the voice of a stranger, although positioned as an adult authority figure, is terrifying and threatening to the children of the film. Uh, and what, what's interesting about this is that actually, like in terms of brain development, uh, children do perceive if they've spent the majority of their life like around their parents and are not used to strangers. Strangers can seem very scary. Uh, or even thinking of the abuse angle with like an adult, like kids are told you have to listen to adults. Even if that adult could be telling you to do something harmful, uh, it is a child's natural inclination to listen to an adult authority figure if that has been instilled in them as something that they should do. Uh, so yeah, this authority figure is very terrifying and threatening to the children in the film, and the fear surrounding this darkness and things that are outside of the standard perception are common with both children and adults, but the differences around the understanding of the perceived versus real threats is what really makes it more scary for kids. Um, an adult may fear the dark, but rationalize that fear is only like a perceived threat. It's not real. It's not, nothing's going to actually hurt me in this darkness. Um, but a child is not going to be able to talk themselves out of that. Uh, they will perceive, they won't be able to tell the difference between a perceived threat and a very real and visceral one. So understanding like an adult is like, all right, if I turn the hall light off and walk to my room, nothing bad's going to happen to me in the middle. Unless I like I trip, you know, mm -hmm. but a kid might feel very viscerally that something is chasing them. Even if that's not happening, any kind of sound can really activate that terror that they feel. Um, and essentially a child just has a harder time telling the difference between the two as their minds have less time to cognitively develop. So Crystal Lewis, a clinical psychologist and researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health noted that people may experience fears of the dark very commonly, but this is due to things that they see or hear about thoughts in their head or bad things they may have experienced. So the darkness can also manifest their trauma as well. So if this was a movie about abuse, uh, the fact that the abuse like scenarios would perpetuate in this dark mm -hmm. house mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, she also said some people have a biological predisposition to the fear and anxiety, which can manifest at night, uh, due to generational trauma, which I just found objectively interesting. Um, that like your generational existence, could influence your specific fears around like just existing at night. Um, well, I mean, it's the, if you think about just like evolution, yeah, right? like where we develop to to fear things for our safety, and if like historically and like your ancestor history, that thing has been scary. I can see that holding on through the genes to to yeah you feel safe. So exactly. And like, so in many ways, these fears don't have to be something that is externally motivated. Ultimately, uh, children basically can have just like a natural inclination towards this fear because of generational trauma as the cause. Mm -hmm. So you could have a child who's having night terrors, not because they're traumatized, but like in that stage of existence, but literally just because there's generational trauma that's influencing those fears. Um, and kind of like right. influencing their imaginations um, because of it being genetic. It's a biological predisposition. So super interesting. Um, and as children are inclined to fill that empty space with their imaginations, this capacity for the fear, if it is instinctual, can be even more stressful. Um, and what occupies their imagination are filled with the context given, as I said, by their parents, things they see, but as well as instinct. So what they fear additionally is usually but not exclusively influenced by what they witness and see. Uh, and that's evidence in this article that I read on Better Health channel titled Anxiety and Fear in Children. And they unpack the way fear impacts children at different developmental stages. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go through this as kind of like year by year. So it kind of goes through, this article goes through like one, the things that influence fear and anxiety within children. So it can be that you have genetic susceptibility, which I mentioned before, 
or the representation of like mental health issues in the parent that they're interacting with. So if they have an anxious parent, children learn how to behave by watching their parents. So if they have a parent that's very stressed out all the time or very anxious about what's around them, those fears will transfer to the child. Um, this always this also accounts for overprotective parenting. So if a dependent child is more likely to feel helpless, this can lead to generalized anxiety because like they're used to their parent protecting them. And when that parent is not there, that really just like adds to the separation anxiety uh, associated with that. And obviously like stressful events uh, such as trauma, uh, such as parental separation and injury or hospital stay can exasperate these fears uh, and make them worse. So they kind of go through this at each developmental stage. I also read a few articles that were talking about like the prenatal, like while you're still on your stomach, the stomach, uh, the ways that your brain develops and how that can like influence your fears. But uh, I'm really going to focus like postnatal, like they're out into the world yeah. uh, just cause like that seems like it relates more to the film itself and that we're just not getting into like fun science series. Um, <laughs> so once a baby has reached six to seven months of age, they have formed strong attachments to their parents or caregivers separation from their special people, even for short periods of time can cause considerable anxiety plenty of crying and uh, just like a general feeling of like unsafeness. Um, similarly, many babies prefer the exclusive company of their special people so much that they develop fear of strangers, strangers for a period of time. Uh, it is said that babies will grow out of this, but it is something that takes place where the face of another person could be genuinely scary for a baby. Mm -hmm. Um, and they give some suggestions on ways to help the child cope with this. So if you are a new parent and you're dealing with a six to seven month old child who's experiencing a lot of fear or anxiety, they do list some steps and things that you can do to kind of help babies cope with that separation anxiety as well as this fear of strangers. So it basically just says like communicate with your baby. Like if you're in the room, announce you're there, announce when you're leaving, communicate like when you're going away so that they can develop trust for you. Um, and basically like and get, let your baby get to know other people. And that's hard, especially in a pandemic society, mm -hmm. uh, because now are really are, we've been retrained to not let people know because babies are immunocompromised. So I feel like we're actually going to probably have a decent amount of babies who are very strong with the stranger danger fear. Mm -hmm. Um, because there hasn't been a lot of socialization outside of like the family group. Um, and they say, if your baby is anxious, a good thing to do is to reassure them uh, with like a calm and confident expression, especially in that six to seven month stage, they're looking at your face primarily. I read like a very long article about this where like how babies eyes develop in terms of like what they are seeing most is that in their very early stages, they're mostly used to seeing faces very close up to them. Um, so like their perception is mostly facial driven. So like you making a confident expression while it reassuring them is actually the best way to calm them down instead of like, say you're standing far away and doing the exact same thing because them being able to see a clear image of your face seeing that you feel calm and confident will reassure them into believing the same thing. Um, and they actually say, this is something we talked about in previous episodes, but that leaving your baby to cry it out is actually the worst thing you can do. Self-soothing does not exist. Your baby is literally able to die at any moment when they're like, that's their perception of life <laughs> when they're little. So do not leave them to cry them out, cry it out because that'll just make their anxiety worse. It's also uh, like people who are like, I'll just let them cry it out or whatever. It's like, are you calling my baby a liar? Yeah, like you're saying no, they don't exactly. actually mean something because they absolutely do. <laughs> yeah, because like, they they are babies. They do not have the ability to, to survive on their own, so they do need you. If they're crying, it is for a reason. If they yeah. feel like they need to see you, that's a valid reason. You know, they might miss you. It's yeah. okay to go help your baby when they cry because <laughs> honestly, if you don't, their anxiety will get worse. Their feels, fears will get worse because they'll become aware at a very early age that they don't have backup. They don't have that support that they need and it'll just exacerbate those symptoms essentially. Um, it goes on to discuss like the common fears for toddlers, specifically children aged around two to three years old. So now we're getting closer to like Kevin's age range. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So they're just learning how to like cope with strong feelings such as anger. And a common fear for a toddler is that they will be overwhelmed by powerful emotions. So like they're just experiencing like what it is to like feel things and not understand why. So this is like the most important time to give them the context that they lack. Specifically when I was talking about like their cognitive development, half of their anxiety and fear is that there's just so much of the world that they have to take in that like they don't have any context for rationalizing their reality. So their imagination is going to fill it with like kind of nonsensical and scary things. This is why like there's that like come into your body moment when your memory starts to solidify (laughs) because before then it's just chaos. All you're seeing is like detached and like kind of scary images of like items and hands that don't really have context sounds sound way scarier you're just cognitive processing is super different because it's has so little context to work with so as i said toddlers have a limited understanding of size and very likely will develop seemingly irrational fears uh because they don't really have a perception of space or like what is possible versus not possible so like a big thing that they say is like don't dismiss your child's fears because to them it is real Mm -hmm. um so like even though it seems like silly or irrational to you that they think they might fall down the hole in the toilet to them that's like visceral and like terrifying because they don't know that that like can't happen you Mm -hmm. know so they say suggestions to help your toddler are basically like talking to them about their fears and anxieties like communication is a big piece of it like being open and communicative with your baby uh to let them know everything is okay and like appreciate that it's genuine for them so like don't belittle them or tell them like face their fears because it actually doesn't help (laughs) it actually like furthers the anxiety unless you're like really talking them through it um it's essentially just going to like further validate the fear or even just like it will become a phobia where it's not even based on anything rational uh just is like an inherent and overwhelming emotion because the toddler that at that age is just so susceptible to their emotions um and then essentially like understanding that this can be so visceral like i know like when i was little i had so many fears and they would feel like life and death like i would be very convinced that like i remember one time my mom jokingly said that like she was going to like leave me somewhere. And I thought she was so serious that I started hysterically crying and she had to like talk me down. So it's like, you really just have to like accept that like your child is in a space where their emotions are a lot and they're not ready to hear jokes and that you should not (laughs) joke about their emotional things. Like it is reality for them. Um, So yeah, it's just like them learning and perceptive perceiving the world um and that like a lot of their things and their fears stem from like very real fears that could result in their harm uh and that like things like fear of the dark will evolve eventually into like more realistic fears like fear of burglary fear of wolves in the woods you know what i mean like things that like could actually harm them in real life it's all motivated from a real and rational space it's just maybe not contextualized in a way that seems uh rational um so as they kind of get keep going we see that like ways that you can kind of help them is just like encouraging them that they're safe and that like they're gonna be okay um And that this, like, fear of the dark is something that's probably going to be around for a while. So, like, they also say, like, in another article that I read that, like, you're not supposed to be, like, using that fear against them. Like, that's actually super manipulative and harmful. Like, do your homework or the boogeyman's going to get you. Like, that's, like, messed up. You don't say that to your baby because the baby believes the boogeyman exists and, like, is actually going to come for them. And your reinforcement of the fear is kind of like how, like, if they believe in Santa and you tell them Santa's real, they're going to believe you. If you reinforce that the boogeyman is real, that fear is only going to solidify further until they have the greater context to, like, rationalize that it's not real you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like when they realize the truth about santa (laughs) it's gonna be like similar and like it's gonna take them a while to get there and you're reinforcing this fear that is going to be genuinely terrifying for them release cortisol which is inherently damaging to the developing body um so 
at the end of the day, this film like does like a really amazing job playing upon all those very real and visceral fears, specifically like that ch- like the ch- child perspective of things around them, how it feels ginormous, you know, like the hallway that never ends. Mm-hmm. If you feel like your perception of what is around you is that vast as it really does to a baby, um, it's going to be really hard to navigate that. And I think what we see with Kaylee uh, is like the parentification of a really young child and her having to like care for her brother in a situation where she is still very much way too young to be taking care of even herself. Um, you kind of see like the loss of self too. So like in the absence of her face is that she is no longer gets to be a kid. She no longer gets to be herself. She has to be this figure for Kevin to protect him. And in doing so is neglecting herself and her own safety. Um, is my interpretation. Uh, but yeah, so it's just basically, if you are interested in learning about like the fear of the dark and the way that that is going to, if you're going to have kids or if you have kids impact your babies, uh, the article does go on to like really get into specifically the fear of darkness, um, and how that develops as the child gets older. But like the biggest thing that they say is like, don't tell them they're wrong ask them to explain what they're feeling and like really communicate with them so that like that fear feels less overwhelming. Um, and like in doing that in brain development in general, you're really going to give your child the ability to like communicate their needs as they get older and it'll just make them better communicators in life. It'll help them stay out of situations that would be otherwise abusive because they advocate for themselves and have the ability to like communicate their needs. So ultimately it is a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kat, for the the little note about Kaylee having to grow too fast. Cause that's super true. Like her she's the one who has that conversation with the parent figure. Mm-hmm. And like that's her having to like protect him, you know, from the reality of all the stress that they're going through. Yeah. And so it's it is that's super valid. I'm glad you brought that up because wasn't in my section i agree that we should believe babies when they're scared yeah and protect them like you know we we're we're advocates for you know scaring your kids but it's with that idea of like consent right Mm -hmm. they're watching something that's like excessively scary like for kids with that in mind like you're not subjecting your kids to some form of torture to toughen them up uh, it's yeah. more just like to kind of give them that thrill and an understanding of the world, but always from a safe space so that they like the ultimate part of scaring your kids and, and our theories for that is that they learn that you're safe and that they're safe and that no matter what is happening on the screen, like they can have that within them. They can find a safety. They can find a strength in that. And that's not mm-hmm. the case if you're just like outright just trying to spook them so you can get a laugh out of it <laughs> like that's not yeah how it works. no 100 and it's like the the motivation for watching horror with your kids is that you're there to like help them rationalize it and understand that it's not real you know like you're mm-hmm. the sounding board and if they don't have that sounding board it's just actually horrifying um like it's context that like is not okay for them so 100 percent well, I think, you know, this was such a great way to end our The Kids Are All Right series since it is explicitly a horror film that not only, you know, follows children, but reduces us back to a childlike understanding of the darkness or, you know, natural fear of the darkness, which I was really thankful for. And like, even now I'm like (laughs) in my office, I have a lot of my wigs on the walls because of my cosplay. And like, I could see them in the mirror and one of them very much just looks like a very tall man. And (laughs) that's that's freaking me out like so bad. So I can't wait for this episode to be over so that I can turn the light on. Me you can turn too, every light man. on in my house. And I hope that you do watch Skin of a Rink. And if that if you did, I hope it activated that thrill of fear that comes with the unknown. 
and it made you do that run to the bathroom where you turn on the light and you close the door and how you yeah. don't want your foot to f- come out of the covers and hang off the bed just in case <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, like, freaking myself out now watching the background of my own video, feeling like there's stuff there, and it's freaking me out, so I can't wait to turn the lights back on. <laughs> yeah. It looks like stuff is there, Gabe. It I does, can't. it does. I was watching you the whole time, and I was like, your closet's pretty dark over there. <laughs> Stop. I'm oh, sorry. Stop. So, uh, all the dancing darkness say... hallway is here. Oh, I can't. I'm so I'm afraid of my own damn hallway. I'm 31 years old. <laughs> Got me afraid of the dark. I, uh, yeah, I'm just very thankful to Kyle Edward Ball for creating something so peculiar. And there has been like this resurgence of kind of uh, experimental horror, just unsettling horror. Um, like I think of uh, We're All Going to the World's Fair and some of those films mm-hmm. like that. And so yeah if you have recommendations for films similar to this if you you know that i'm a big horror of found footage or just weird footage films uh definitely let me know would love to hear about them it's it it triggers all the good parts of my horror senses for sure and Mm -hmm. yeah definitely check it out let us know what you think of the film. What are your theories? What do you think it's actually saying? Because you're right and you're also wrong. And I love that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, this is the end of our Kids Are All Right. We got a new series coming for you next month. And we will have the lights on when we do it. Yeah, the whole time. <laughs> promise. <laughs> You'll be able to see our faces for real. So, yeah. uh, don't get married. Don't eat your kids. The darkness will come for your children. What a nightmare. Terrifying. <laughs>